Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel and if you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Gabby and welcome. Welcome to my true crime corner of the internet. I think that's what we're gonna call it from now on. If you've never been here before, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover, a little bit more on the vintage side, they're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something you might be interested in, maybe go down below, hit that subscribe button, turn on post notifications, you know the deal. But before we get into the video, we do have a quick word from today's sponsor, and today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh. Let me ask you something. Have you been in a food rut lately, making the same meals over and over again? You maybe come up with a recipe, thought of it yourself, found it in an old cookbook, foodnetwork.com. You say you're going to make it one day. You never do. Same. But HelloFresh can change that. It's so good that even my cat got into the box before I did. <laughs> Anyways, HelloFresh is the answer to your same old food routine with so many new recipes to choose from every single week with tons of extra food options such as low calorie, carb smart, vegetarian, pescatarian, there's something for everyone and they send you the entire meal kit with everything you'll need and photos to show you how to make it step by step. I'm a visual learner so I need that. All the recipes are also super easy to make and you can get them to the table in 30 minutes or less. I personally chose the vegetarian option and I was completely blown away. This barbecue pineapple flatbread seriously changed my life. I made two meals for my family and even my stepdad, who is seriously the pickiest eater ever, loved them and we're gonna be ordering some more very soon. One thing that I also love about HelloFresh is they're doing good for the world. We love a company that gives back. For instance, their packaging is made up of almost entirely recycled material and they have donated over 4 million meals to charity just last year in 2020. If you want to try HelloFresh yourself, you can go to hellofresh.com. You're gonna use code GABULOSIS10 at checkout, and this will get you 10 free meals across four HelloFresh boxes, and this includes free shipping on your first box. What are you waiting for? HelloFresh. Thank you, HelloFresh, for sponsoring today's video, and with all that being said, let's get right into the case. Today we're going to be discussing the case of Jane Doe, number 12, also known as Dolores Wolf. Benicia, a waterside city in Solano County, California, located in the region of North Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's known as a hidden gem of California rich in history, a great art community, and amazing shopping and dining, all while having a great view of the waterfront. It's a small community, though, with an even smaller past of violence and crime. Nothing too shocking happens here, but that would all change in the year of 1979. On September 17th of the year 1979, Boaters came across something washed up on the shore in the Carquinez Strait region. It was the lower torso of a woman. It was only the lower half of a human being. It didn't seem like she had been purposely cut in half, like say the Black Dahlia. This Jane Doe was most likely cut in half due to propellers on a boat. Authorities were notified immediately and they took over from there. The waters nearby were searched for her upper half, but they were never able to to locate it and still have not to this day. Benicia police knew that they were going to have a very difficult time discovering who this woman was and for two main reasons. The two main ways to identify an individual back then were through dental records and fingerprints. But this was just the lower half of a torso. There were no teeth or fingers to view. Within no time, they were pretty much at a loss. There was nothing much they could do to help the case without the upper part of the woman's body. They named this doe Jane Doe number 12 and buried her remains in a grave in Solano County. This mysterious case that rocked the area of Benicia during the latter part of 1979 would sit collecting dust for four decades. That is until July of 2020, when an investigator with the Doe Network, a nonprofit organization of volunteers who work with law enforcement to connect missing persons cases with John and Jane Doe cases, got in touch with the Solano County Sheriff's Office because they thought they had a potential match for Jane Doe number 12. This potential match fell through though. 
It wasn't their Jane Doe, but this did spark some more people's interest in the torso case again. Coincidentally, Benicia police detective Kenneth Hart was looking into the case as well during this time. They of course had looked into women back in 1979 who were reported missing around the Benicia area, but Detective Hart expanded the search and he started looking into women who were reported missing during the year of 1979 in different areas around California, like Sacramento, San Francisco, and everywhere in between. He narrowed his search down to 11 main women he thought could possibly be their Jane Doe, but within a small amount of time, he soon began focusing on one main individual. He thought there was a huge possibility the torso belonged to a woman who vanished in late July of 1979 from Woodland, California of Yolo County, an area about 50 to 60 miles northeast of Benicia. Detective Hart contacted the Yolo County Sheriff's Office so they could directly contact one of the woman's four living offspring and ask for a DNA sample so they could compare it to the DNA of the unidentified torso. They exhumed the torso and collected DNA from one of the femur bones. The DNA, along with the DNA from one of the woman's offspring, was sent over to the Department of Justice DNA lab for comparison. The test results came back, and they notified the Benicia Police Department that it was in fact a match. After four decades, Jane Doe number 12 was finally identified. Her name was Dolores Wolf, an incredible woman whose disappearance case is an entire story of its own. So let's get into that story right now. Dolores Wolf was born on November 4th, 1933. She was married to a man named Carl L. Wolf, and they had tied the knot on June 4th, 1955 at St. James Catholic Church in Davis, California. The two had a very traditional and classy wedding with over 400 of their closest friends and family in attendance. By how beautiful their wedding sounded from accounts, it's shocking to hear how their love story would end. We do know that during the year of 1962, seven years after they got married, they were living more towards the city of Woodland, California. At this time, they had two children together, and Carl owned Carl's mobile service that was only about a mile from their house. As time passed, two children would become four, and they wanted a little escape, so they decided to move to an area more considered the country, still in Woodland, but not right where the hustle and bustle is. The family moved to a neighborhood called the Hillcrest Estates, and they loved it there. At this time, they had four children. Carl and Dolores had Carl Jr., Anna Marie, Paul, and Tom. Carl went on to be a very successful insurance agent, and Dolores was working at Woodland High School as a secretary. Woodland High School is a school that has been standing for a very long time, by the way. It was built in 1894. Five. Dolores loved working there and she was one of those members of faculty that everyone at the school absolutely adored. She was just a sweet woman and she had this very contagious smile. Dolores was very outgoing. You never saw her in a bad mood and she just always wanted to help people. That was kind of her thing. This was a woman with no known enemies and from the outside it looked like her life was nearly perfect, but people would be second guessing that during the summer of 1979. At this time, Dolores was 45 years old, and on August 1st, 1979, the entire community would be in shock over the fact that the night before, on July 31st, 1979, the sweetheart secretary at Woodland High School vanished. The events leading up to Dolores' disappearance are odd to say the least. At this time, Dolores and Carl's two oldest children, Carl Jr. and Anna Marie, were 21 years old and 19 years old, so both of them had moved out of their family home. The only two children still living at home were Paul and Tom, and on the date of July 31st, they were staying at their uncle Matthew's house. Matthew is the brother of Dolores, and she and Matthew were extremely close. On Tuesday, July 31st, at around 9.30 p.m., Carl Jr. stopped by the family home to grab the pickup truck. I'm not sure if this was his pickup truck that he had left there or a family vehicle he was borrowing, but that was his reasoning for stopping by. 
Carl Jr. claimed that he did notice his mother looked extremely upset, like she had been crying before he arrived. He also stated he remembered she was in the living room of the home and at the time she was wearing a green colored nightgown. That was the last time he ever saw his mother. About an hour later, at around 10.30 p.m., Carl Wolf uses the home phone to call a Ms. Deborah Morgan, a former Woodland police officer, and he asked her out for drinks. Yes, he asked a woman out for drinks while his wife of 24 years, nearly a quarter of a century, was in the same house as him. Carl wanted to meet her that night. She declined his offer, but said she could meet him the next day for lunch. The next thing we know is that at around six in the morning on August 1st, Anna Marie phoned her father. Carl was supposedly awoken by this phone call. And while on the phone with his daughter, he acted like he had just woken up and just realized that Dolores was missing, that she wasn't in the home. The suspicious thing though, is that he looked around the home very quickly and told Anna Marie that Dolores had left her keys, medicine, glasses, rings, clothes, and car. When he was on the phone with his daughter, he never actually went out to the garage to check if the car was left behind or not. So basically he was on the phone with his daughter. He was looking around the house saying that Dolores wasn't there. He was naming the items she had left behind, very crucial items that she would have brought with her. And one of the things was the car, but Anna Marie said that when she was on the phone with him, he never actually went out to the garage to check and see if the car was there or not. How did he know the car was still there if he actually never went to the garage to check and see if it was or not? Suspicious. Their home was not in the center of town anymore like it was years back. They lived a far ways out. If Dolores was going to up and leave in the middle of the night, she would have had to walk miles to get to anyone else. And not to mention it was nighttime, completely dark. And it was noted that Dolores was afraid of the dark. There were no street lights to their home and the only thing she would have left the home with was the nightgown she was wearing and possibly sandals. The day of August 1st went on and at this time Paul and Tom were still at their uncle's. The time of the day came when their mother was supposed to pick them up but she never arrived and she never would. Paul and Tom left their home the night before and they had no idea that they were never going to be returning to it again. Suspiciously, we know that Carl did actually meet Deborah Morgan for lunch that day. Yes, on the day of his wife's disappearance, he met another woman at a Denny's for lunch. Deborah would later tell authorities that during lunch, Carl seemed on edge, very nervous and quite distraught. I wonder why. At the very start of this case, the very beginning of Dolores Wolf's disappearance, Pretty much everyone thought the same thing, and that was that Carl had something to do with it. He was even described by his own children as an abusive alcoholic. Even his own children said that. Two days after Dolores mysteriously vanished, Tom Wolf went up to his father and asked him straight up, where is my mom? Where's mom? And Carl told him that his mom was gone and that she was never coming back. Tom stood up and told him that that was bullshit. That's exactly what he said. He said that was bullshit because her kids were her entire life and that she would never just leave her kids and voluntarily never return to them. It was no secret that people were looking intensely at Carl and there was a lot of aspects that made him look suspicious. Authorities were notified about Dolores' disappearance and they immediately started questioning the husband's innocence. Investigators started looking around the home, seeing what they could find. Nothing looked too out of the ordinary though. They questioned Carl. He told them a story we've heard too many times before. He told authorities that she must have been unhappy with her life and that she probably just up and left and started a new life somewhere else. That is literally always the story. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that in a case, I would donate a lot of money and there would be a lot of cases solved. Anyways, then investigators looked in the family vehicles and this is where they found some 
interesting evidence. In the trunk of one of the couple's cars, they would find one of Dolores's earrings. Strange, but you know, it's just one earring. Maybe it fell off. But then they found a blanket, a blanket with very noticeable blood stains on it. Yes, blood stains, stains of blood after a disappearance. They also found blood stains on parts of the rubber molding on the outside of the vehicle. And yes, they did come to the conclusion that was 100% human blood. When Carl, Carl, was asked about the blood stains, he said that he was pretty sure the blood stains on the blanket came from a nosebleed. <laughs> That's a new one. Everyone had a feeling Carl was guilty, but this was 1979 and they actually needed a body. Technology was not like it is in today's time. They didn't have DNA testing to see if the blood stains were actually Dolores's. They had to find her body. They looked everywhere around the area of woodland, in ditches, in creeks, in the hills and valleys. They searched and searched and searched for what Matthew said felt like millions of acres. They even brought in psychics. One psychic strangely said that Dolores would eventually be found in water and that it was her husband who was responsible. Time passed though, as it does, and the main suspect in this case was still the same person, Carl Wolf. It was the only person that made any sense to anyone. Eventually, they had probable cause to arrest him and they did, but this was bittersweet because detectives knew that it probably wouldn't go anywhere without a murder weapon or her remains being found. In the year 1985, Carl Wolf was indicted on murder charges by the Yolo County Grand Jury. Carl's attorney was a woman named Sally Soliday, and she claimed that the case was a phantom case based on faulty memories and sketchy evidence. She literally said that blood on a blanket right after a disappearance case was sketchy evidence. Within nine months, the entire case was dismissed because a visiting judge came in and basically said that it wasn't fair and it was against Carl's constitutional rights because he didn't have access to a speedy trial. Which is basically what detectives figured from the start. Now, during that same year of 1985, Paul Wolf tried to file a wrongful death suit against his father, but that also fell through. Carl then tried to be petty and counter sue his entire family. Thankfully though, that was also dropped. Through the years, everyone's anger towards Carl grew. Now, right after Dolores went missing, her brother Matthew phoned Carl and he basically told Carl to tell authorities what happened to Dolores within 24 hours or he would slit his throat, which yes, that's a threat but Matthew was just very filled with rage. He loved his sister and he knew Carl was responsible. Carl immediately went to police after that and instead of confessing, he told police that he was being harassed by Matthew and then authorities went to Matthew and said, you know, you gotta stop that, can't be making threats. We know you're angry, but don't do it. Matthew was actually the one who would end up taking in Paul and Tom and raising them as his own in Davis, California after his sister went missing. This was a man who spoke very highly of his sister and honestly, there was no one in the world that was more fit to take care of her boys than him. Carl and Dolores' youngest son, Paul Wolf, decided once during his freshman year of college to go visit his father and see if he could maybe get him to confess after so many years. Carl didn't and that was when Paul decided to never speak to his father again and he never did. Now through the years, Carl pretty much always played victim. He acted like his wife simply left and that the entire experience scarred him and he has no idea why his children and everyone else thought he did it. No one really ever spoke to him again and Carl Wolf would end up dying a very lonely man at the age of 70 on February 23rd of 2005. That was where the case stood. 
on a cliffhanger until 2020, when it was discovered that Dolores Wolf's lower torso had actually been found washed up on a shore six weeks after her disappearance. Tom Wolf said his first reaction to the news was anger. He was furious that part of her remains were found so soon after and they had no idea for so many years. Then within time, that anger faded to gratitude. He was grateful they at least had some answers and that they were able to bury these found remains next to her parents. Something that every Jane and John Doe deserves, a proper burial, a respectful final resting place. Dolores' son Paul did an amazing interview with the Sacramento Bee where he discussed his mother, what he remembered from the day she went missing, and how his life was after everything happened. He definitely didn't have it the easiest and he was the youngest child, so he had the least amount of time with his mother while she was still alive. He would go on to find a passion though while his family fell apart, and that was football. He even had a brief professional playing career in the World League of American Football. Poor Paul would actually suffer another tremendous heartbreak in 2002 when his first wife, Tammy, passed away after a long battle with brain cancer at the age of 39. Tammy, from what I read, seemed like a phenomenal woman, someone his mother definitely would have loved. Before Tammy passed away, though, she actually introduced Paul to a nurse at a clinic she volunteered at, and she wanted them to hit it off because she knew she wasn't going to have much time left on earth, and she wanted him to move on, remarry, and be happy. He and this nurse are actually still together to this day. Back to the actual case though, when Paul learned about the positive DNA comparison of Jane Doe number 12 and his mother, he was obviously in complete shock. He couldn't believe it. This was something he hoped for for so long. He said it was like they were all finally at peace. Peace of mind, you might say. There was so much satisfaction that everything was finally over with. One main part of finding out some of her remains were found weeks after she vanished that is just so heartbreaking but reassuring is that it proves to all of them that she didn't just walk out on them, that she didn't just leave her life behind and start over somewhere else. Of course, they all knew this, but this was something that now they never had to second guess. Of course, with this case, there are still so many unanswered questions. And the main one is what exactly happened between 9.30 p.m. of July 31st, 1979 and 6 a.m. of August 1st, 1979 at the Wolf Home. But like always, leave your thoughts about this case down below in the comments and leave a little love down there for Dolores' family as well because you never know who might come across this video. Thank you for spending a little bit of time out of your day to learn about this case and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.